The makers of Campbell's Soups present the Campbell Playhouse, Orson Welles' producer. Good evening, listeners. This is Ernest Chappell speaking. Tonight, Orson Welles and the Campbell Playhouse observe a Campbell tradition of long standing. They bring you Charles Dickens' well loved tale of Yuletide, A Christmas Carol. Four years ago, the makers of Campbell's soups went shopping for a Christmas present to give to all their friends. They found it in this story, Charles Dickens' embodiment of the very spirit of Christmas. And they chose well, because throughout the country today, in thousands of homes, it has become an important and beloved Christmas custom to listen to this story. Tonight, this fourth annual presentation is brought to you with the sincere wish that your Christmas may be a happy one and with the hope that the retelling of A Christmas Carol may help to make it so. And it is more than that, for with this Christmas present to you, Campbell's say thank you for your purchases of Campbell's soup throughout the months gone by. At the Christmas season, this becomes especially manifest. Everywhere, grocers see their shelves of Campbell's soups dwindle more rapidly now than at any other time of the year. It used to be thought that the demand increased in preparation for the Christmas feast. But really, it isn't that alone. Women like to have plenty of good soups on hand all through the holidays so that they can serve piping hot, nourishing platefuls at any family mealtime. The youngsters are on the go all day long, making the most of the Christmas vacation, and soup can be ready for them in a jiffy. There's health and happiness in good hot soup. Your grocer has Campbell's soups, 21 delicious kinds, awaiting your selection. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was one of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Since the days of Caesar Augustus, all people have celebrated by joy the great joy which shall be to all people. For unto us was born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And on this day, at least in the calendar of our year, we affirm the glory of our God by the laughter of our children. Every nation, according to its character and its taste, by some gift of gaiety, has enriched the tradition of this, our solemnest festival. And because America is what it is, we are the fortunate heirs of the accumulated customs of almost 2,000 years of keeping Christmas. 
The best songs that have been sung are sung by us. The best games that have been played, we play, and the best stories ever told are ours to tell. For storytelling has persisted as a Christmas ritual, in spite of the printing press. A ceremony as hilarious and as serious as hanging the stocking, dressing the tree, and kissing under the mistletoe. And because Christmas is first of all for children, Christmas stories are fairy stories first of all. It is mildly surprising that the best of them all, which we're telling again for you tonight, is for everybody and turns out to be a ghost story. I have endeavored, writes its author on its title page, I have endeavored in this ghostly little story to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. It is signed, your faithful friend and servant, Charles Dickens. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners. I don't know how many years. Oh, he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, secret and self-contained. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was a cold, bleak, biting evening, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement to warm them. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eyes upon the clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond worked at his ledgers. Twenty-nine, nine and carry two, uh, thirteen, seventeen, seven and carry one, and... Close the door, Cratchit! Shut out that infernal noise! Yes, Mr. Scrooge! Confound their impudence. Okay, uh, Cratchit. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. You ought to stop at Father Guild on your way home tonight and collect that 17 shillings and sixpence he owed me since Michaelmas and tell him I shall have the constable over here if he doesn't pay it once. Well, sir, Mr. Father Guild's wife is... What do I care about his wife? Well, I want my 17 and six. I, I just thought it being Christmas... Christmas, but... Christmas. Merry Christmas. I... Merry Christmas, Bob. Oh, Mr. Fred. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Oh. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Huh? Bah. Humbug. Humbug? Christmas a humbug, Uncle? <laughs> I'm sure you don't mean that. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What season have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Well, come then, Uncle. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Ah, humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be? I live in such a world of fools. It's Christmas to you, but a time for paying bills without money. <laughs> merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stick of his own holly through his heart. But Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Hey, let me leave it alone, then. What do you want, nephew? Christmas gift, I have no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Ah, Merry Christmas. Much good may Christmas do you. Much good has it ever done you. <laughs> there are many things from which I've derived good. By which I have not profited, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. Therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas. Hello! Let me hear another sound from you out there, Bob Cratchit. You keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Uh, that's just you, nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Talk enough nonsense. <laughs> Don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I've tried. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And uh, Happy New Year, too. Humbug. Humbug. Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and the missus. 
And the tiny Tim. Thank you, Mr. Fred. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Merry Christmas, Uncle Ebenezer! What a nonsense. Flummery. Talking of Christmas, not a... Not a sixpence to jingle against another in his trousers' pocket. Are you there, Bob Cratchit? Yes, You're sir. There. Yes, what sir. are you doing in there? Oh, I was only putting a bit more coal on the fire, Mr. Scrooge, seeing it's so cold in here, sir. You put that coal back in the scuttle. Yes, sir. Fire. Fire, indeed. I can tell you, if you use coal at that rate, you and I will be soon part in company, Bob Cratchit. Do you understand that? Many a young fellow like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. Then put on your mitten. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! There's someone at the door. See who it is. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas, sir. Oh, Merry Christmas. Uh, yes, sir? This is the firm of Scrooge and Marley. Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. Step this way, please. Yeah, what is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Huh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Well, Marley's been dead these seven years tonight. Oh. And I'm Scrooge, though I doubt that'll be any pleasure to you, sir. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sure it will. Now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities. And hundreds of thousands are in want of comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? There are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses, they're still in operation, I trust. I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law and full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. I'm very glad to hear that. I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. Now, uh, sir, what do you want with me? Well, Mr. Scrooge, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund for the poor and destitute. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous, sir? I wish to be let alone. I don't make merry at Christmas time, and I can't afford to help make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments and take care of the poor. They cost enough that those who are badly off go there. Well, many can't go there, sir, and many would rather die. Let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, how do I know that's true? You might know it someday, Mr. Scrooge. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Cratchit! Y- yes, sir. This way, sir, please. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute threepence. It's all I can afford. But if there are others in worse situation than I... You're a generous fellow. I wish I might say the same of your employer. Good afternoon, sir. Good day. Merry Christmas. Good afternoon, sir. And a Merry Christmas. Oh, 15, 24, 31, 1 and carry 3... 17, 22, 33, 3, and carry 3, 4, 7, 8, Cratch 12, it. 15... Cratch oh, it! Yes, sir. Cratch it. Too late to have it go to Father Gills. He'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up this place now. Yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Mm. Hard to see the figures. I suppose you want the entire day to mark. That's it. If... Quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown of your wages for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir... And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, Yeah, sir. once a year. Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. I'll see that you're here all the earlier the next morning, do you understand? Oh, I, I will, sir, uh, I will. Well, good night, sir. Good night, and... Good night, Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. Bah! The office was closed to a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill 20 times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern and having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to his dismal house. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands. The fog and frost hung about the black old gateway of the house. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. Before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. 
small fire in the grate of his bedroom, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel upon the hob. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in the closet. Closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in. Then took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed. Nothing on such a bitter night. Not even enough to kindle a glow of light in the cheerless room. Scrooge stretched his numb fingers over the wretched fire. Then he saw something that made that made him draw them back. Slowly the meager embers dissolved before his astonished eyes, dissolved into a face, a ghostly face but one that Scrooge recognized as the face of Marley. Marley, his partner, dead these seven years. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hairs were curiously stirred, like flames blown from a chimney draft. And through the death-cold eyes, Scrooge saw the buttons on the back of his coat. <laughs> Humbug. 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 Scrooge got up and walked away from the fire. As he turned, his glance happened to rest upon a bell. A disused bell that hung in the corner of the room. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing... Slowly at first. face he had seen in the fire, Marley's face, and Marley, Marley's body coming straight at him through the door, a body pale as the bluish smoke that comes out of a chimney on a cold day, a body so transparent that Scrooge, looking through his waistcoat, could see his watch in his waistcoat pocket. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle, it was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Even now, Scrooge would not believe his eyes. The ghost advanced towards him. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Marley, what do you want with me? Much. Who, who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're, you're particular for a ghost. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley, but you're dead. You died seven years ago this very night. You do not believe in me, then? I, I do not. Why do you doubt your senses? Well, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Uh, humbug, I tell you. Uh, humbug. At this, the spirit, taking the bandage off from it round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. Then uh -huh. the worldly mind. Do you believe in me now? I, I, I do, Jacob, I do. Why do you walk the earth? Why do you come to me, Jacob? It is required of every man with the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turn to happen. Tell me, Jacob, well, what is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. Cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, purses... I made it link by link by my own free will. 
Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven years ago. And you've labored on it since, Ebenezer. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, Ebenezer. No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Jacob! Hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is nearly gone. I, I will, I will, Jacob, but don't be hard on me. Speak to me, Jacob, but please don't be flowery. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Oh, you were always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. And go on, go on, Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. You will be haunted by three spirits. I... I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, Ebenezer Scrooge, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night. Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. Marley! Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed fully dressed. When suddenly the curtains of his bed were drawn aside and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. As close to it as I am now to you and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure like a child yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair which hung about its neck and down its back was white as if with age and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its dress was of the purest white, trimmed with summer flowers. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, but the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprang a clear jet of light by which all this was visible and which was doubtless the occasion of its using in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What business brings you here? What do you want of me? Your welfare. Ebenezer Scrooge, rise and walk with me. No, no, not the window. I'm mortal. I fall down. There, but a touch of my hand, bear upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. Let us go. They stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. They walked along the road. Scrooge began to recognize every gate, every post, every tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs or in sleighs. And all these boys were in great spirits and showed to each other that they were happy, shouting through the broad fields until they were so full of music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. And there stood old Scrooge in his dressing gown and slippers and nightcap on the hill and beside him the spirit of Christmas past. 
And now the spirit spoke again. Not all the boys and girls were singing on that Christmas day, were they, Ebenezer Scrooge? See the bleak building over there? That building? I was a boy there. Yeah, I went to school in that place. You recollect the way... I could walk it blindfold. Strange you have forgotten it for so many years. Come, let us go closer. <laughs> Look through the window into this cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I, I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, sitting alone, a book open before him. <laughs> yes, I see I know that boy. I was lonely. I... <laughs> Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what's that on your cheek? It's nothing, nothing. I... I wish... I was too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. There was some boys singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given them something, that's all. That is all... Come, Ebenezer Scrooge. Let us see another Christmas. another journey to make. Where now? Come. Again, Scrooge saw himself in a room that was vaguely familiar. He was an older man, a man in the prime of his life. And he was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl. There were tears in her eyes. Very little, I know. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. Well, listen to me. There's nothing the world so hard on as poverty, and yet nothing it pretends to condemn so much as the pursuit of wealth. The world again. You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. Bell. Have I changed toward you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better then? No, was it better to be poor? Better at least to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. Do you blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? The word, no. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my life love of any value in your sight. So... I release you from your promise. Bill. Bill. I love you still. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim. Like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer. For the love of him you once were. Spirit, it is enough. Show me no more. 
These were shadows of the things which have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. No more, no more. One shadow more. Come. The relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in a room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. All around them were the voices of children talking and laughing. And before the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl so like the last that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, the girl he had been betrothed to, now a handsome middle-aged woman sitting with her husband at their own fireside. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you. And that girl, that girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. Oh, I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Yes. How can I? Oh, I know. Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered, and there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat, all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit! Spirit, reward me! Haunt me no more! Leave me! Take me back! Take me back! In his anguish, Scrooge began to struggle with the ghost of Christmas past. The lights in the crown of its head burned high and bright. Scrooge, in a last desperate effort, tore the extinguisher cap from its head and by a sudden action, pressed it down upon its head. And Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by irresistible drowsiness. And further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The stroke of one awakened him and sat him bolt upright in his bed. now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to the fourth annual presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Brought to you by the makers of Campbell's Soups. We return you now to the Campbell Playhouse and Orson Welles. On the stroke of one, Scrooge had awakened suddenly and had set him bolt upright in his own bed. You remember the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. He drew aside the curtains and established a sharp lookout all around the bed. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing and consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. And all this time he sat upon the bed with his nightcap upon his head, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it. Being only light, this was more alarming than a dozen ghosts. As he was powerless to make out what it meant, he began to think that the source of this ghostly light 
might be in the adjoining room from whence on further tracing it seemed to shine. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, there was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. From every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. And in easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, Ebenezer Scrooge. You know me better, man. Yeah, yeah. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the light of me before. Spirit. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last time on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. If tonight you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe. The room vanished. So did the fire. The ruddy glow, the hour of night, vanished. Sunlight brushed them as they streamed through the clear morning air. Second Spectre flew at a more leisurely speed, and Scrooge had time to observe people below him shoveling snow on the city roofs, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then pelting each other with snowballs. In the streets below them, the poulterer's shops were still half open. And the fruiterers were radiant in their holiday glory. Scrooge and his ghostly guide circled the tall spires as the steeple called good people all to church and chapel. There below them lay Camden Town with its squalid streets of ugly frame houses. Of all these dwellings, the ghosts selected the humblest for their visit. Scrooge, by now past all surprise, recognized Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed in a twice-turned gown but brave in ribbons, busily laying the table. Assisting her was Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelled a goose and known it for their own, and now basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onions. And three more young Cratchits danced about the table. Then once more, the door opened. Alive, Martha, my dear. How late you are. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. Merry Christmas. How late you are, Martha. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind so long as you're here now. Sit you down before the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. But where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is, and... Sometimes, sometimes I think, oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim, if Tiny Tim should die. Mother, you mustn't even think of such a thing. Here they come. Oh, Tiny, Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Merry Christmas, Father, and Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. <laughs> and there was Bob Cratchit, with at least three feet of comfort, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him in his threadbare clothes, darned up and brushed, to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Poor Tiny Tim. 
He carried a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. How did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh, I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest hymns, and the people were so kind to me. It was such fun riding home on Daddy's shoulder. He behaved as good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped people saw him in church because he was lame. And it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Tim, you darling. <laughs> Mother, <laughs> Mother, I'm happy to Oh, yes, children already. Come take your places and wait your turn. There's plenty of stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. <laughs> Now, Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim, that's right, and see that he eats plenty. He must get strong and well. Now shall we say grace? Yes, Bob. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank thee for the daily bread which in thy mercy thou dost give to us. Bless us this Christmas day, keep us all together, so that for many years to come we may unite here to do thy will and praise thy name. Amen. Amen. And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all. And God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. And now to Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Who pays you all a 15 shillings a week? I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite my for dear, it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure. And which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge? You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. Well, I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And I say God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known, very likely, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim. Until the last. Spirit! Spirit! Tell me if... Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner. And a crutch without an owner. Carefully no, 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 kind spirit. Say he will be spared. Say he will live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future... The child will die. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Now he stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye and then was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. A light shone from the window of a hut. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled around a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman with their children and their children's children all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. This place, Ebenezer Scrooge, the miners live who labor in the bowels of the earth. Still, they know me. You hear? The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe. And passing on above the moor, they sped on. Whither? Not to see. To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land. Below him were the waves breaking upon a frightful range of rocks. But built upon a dismal reef of sunken stones, some league or so from shore, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Hey, 
Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds, born of the wind, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. Again, the ghost sped on above the dark and heaving sea, on and on until they lighted on a ship. They stood beside the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout in the bow, the men who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw, and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home. By poverty, and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing. It was a long night, if it were only a night. And it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered, in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the hour Not has yet. come. Not yet. There are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from still another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer. Scrooge looked about him, the ghost. It had vanished. And he found himself once more in his bed. In his dressing gown and his nightcap on his head. He heard the clock strike. And then he remembered... The prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming toward him, like a mist along the ground. The spirit slowly, gravely, silently approached. In the very air through which it moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. I am the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ebenezer Scrooge, I am about to show you the shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I've seen. Lead on! Lead on! The night is waning fast.